I'll just tell you that, that uh, any national security package has to begin with the security of our own border. That's what the American people deserve. We must get aid to Ukraine, and so we cannot wait. We think there are good proposals on border in the president's bill. It was pretty much a draw. I mean, they didn't get what they wanted, we didn't get what we wanted, and, you know, it's just when they when you change the rules, it's hard to, it's hard to win. Hello, everyone. I'm Weijia Jiang in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. The White House is pushing Congress to pass more aid for Ukraine by the end of the year. President Biden is asking lawmakers for nearly $106 billion to help Ukraine and Israel, plus more money for border security. But Republican lawmakers are trying to get immigration policy changes in exchange. The White House warns the U.S. will run out of funding to send weapons and assistance to Ukraine by the end of the year. Admiral John Kirby joins us now. He is the National Security Council Coordinator for Strategic Communications. Admiral, always great to see you, and thank Thanks. you for joining us today. Oh, it's good to be with you, would you? The White House has made clear to lawmakers that you're running out of time and you're running out of money to fund Ukraine. So. Since the deadline is so sensitive here, John, has the president picked up the phone and engaged with Republicans on this personally? Well, I don't have any phone calls to speak to in terms of the president's schedule, but I can tell you that at various levels throughout the administration, uh, we have and will continue. Uh, to brief and to consult members of Congress about the very real needs when it comes to supporting Ukraine, and, and particularly at this very delicate time here towards the end of the year. And as the winter months make it harder and harder now uh, for the Ukrainians to, to try to make more progress. Republicans have spelled out what they are looking for, and that is policy changes on the border. Is there any room for negotiation here? The last thing I'm going to do is negotiate on television, but I can tell you that the president on day one signed an immigration reform bill, or didn't sign it, put forward an immigration, proposal, immigration reform proposal to Congress, again, on day one of the administration that's been languished and not acted on. Uh, so we're willing to have a discussion with members of Congress about immigration reform, uh, but, you know, we got to have this funding for Ukraine and for Israel, particularly uh, in the case of Ukraine, because... By the end of the year, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to provide any support for them. But, John, it's the White House that bundled border security funding with aid for Ukraine, with aid for Israel, with aid for Indo-Pacific countries. So did that not open up the door for negotiations on the border by attaching all that together? Well, we attached border security and Indo-Pacific security to Ukraine and Israel funding because they're all urgent. They all get right at our national security. And we want that border security funding passed as well. Uh, it will allow for more border patrol agents. It'll allow for more uh, asylum court officers. Uh, it will help with some of the physical infrastructure at the border. So we definitely want that passed as well. These are all important. Each of them matter to the United States and to our national security, and we want Congress to act on them. As I said, uh, we, we have been willing and able uh, to have a discussion about immigration reform in, in this country. And it was something we put forward on day one. Congress has not shown any serious intent or desire to, to talk to us about that. But right now, there's an urgent need for border security funding, uh, and that's what we want them to, to move on. And, John, there's an urgent need, of course, for funding for Israel as well, for Ukraine, all of these things. And the president has already said he would veto any Israel-only bill. But is he open to different iterations of, of these um, packages coming together, or does it have to be all of his priorities or nothing at all? Well, again, I don't want to negotiate here in public. We, we put a very thoughtful supplemental funding request together, Ouija. It was informed very much directly by our Israeli counterparts and our Ukrainian counterparts about what they need in the weeks and months ahead. Israel to go after Hamas, Ukraine to defend its territory against Russia. Uh, those were well-informed decisions and, and well-informed dollar figures. Uh, we think they're all important. And again, we urge Congress to pass this supplemental funding. But I want to stress again, as I said in my, in my first answer to your very first question, we remain in close consultation with members of Congress. We've been briefing them in classified and unclassified sessions about what's going on, particularly in Ukraine, and how desperate the need is for additional support. And before I let you go, Alabama Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville has announced that he is dropping his hold on military nominations, except for four-star general and flag officers. So it's not all, but it's way more than nothing. So can you talk to us about how this will impact military readiness 
and what it means to have a hold on you know nearly a dozen of those four star generals. Yeah, uh, great question, Ouija. First of all, obviously, we're, we're glad to see that the hold's going to get lifted. Uh, that will free up these several hundred officers and now move on with their lives, take new assignments, uh, lead uh, our, our troops uh, in, in, in uh, critical missions. Uh, but we got to get those four stars confirmed as well because they're leading at the very top leadership level. Uh, they're responsible for some very, very strategic issues around the world. Uh, we need to see them confirmed as well just as soon as possible. All right, Admiral John Kirby, thank you so much. My pleasure. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us now. Nicole, today the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, talked about that aid package that I was just chatting with the Admiral about. I want to play some of what he said and then talk to you about it on the other side. I'll just tell you that, that uh, any national security package has to begin with the security of our own border. That's what the American people deserve. We have to affect real policy change at the border, and that is a necessary condition to anything we do going forward. Nicole, is there any wiggle room here, or do you think that Republicans are really going to double down on wanting these policy changes in exchange for Ukraine aid? Well, I think the latter, and I think you heard the speaker elaborate why. I mean, look, he has made clear that he doesn't believe negotiations should go forward with the Biden administration until there is more of a commitment to address some of these uh, fundamental issues at the border and changes that they would like to see. The issue is that for many Democrats, they feel that the changes uh, that Republicans are pushing, uh, you know, whether this is over the issue of asylum seekers, detention, uh, migrants and the like, uh, that they're just simply too draconian, uh, nor should they necessarily be tied to a national security security supplemental that is so uh, urgently needed. In their view, the speaker also wrote back to the budget director, White House budget director, Shalonda Young, who, as you know, just this week kind of sounded the alarm about the importance of continuing funding, particularly for Ukraine, suggesting that there is no magic pot out there to uh, keep that effort funded. Uh, but in his letter or back to, uh, you know, the, the budget director, the speaker uh, again emphasized uh, this importance importance of addressing the border. So I do expect that that will continue to be the position of not only House Republicans, but many Senate Republicans as well going forward. And I know there was a big briefing on Capitol Hill today about that funding, but the White House has been sounding the alarms now for several months. So did that move anything along? Uh, you know, again, I think all sides are pretty entrenched in their positions. And certainly keep in mind, there are many uh, Republicans who are supportive of the need to provide Ukraine with additional aid. But, uh, you know, in the view at least of the Speaker and many House Republicans, they simply want more accountability. They want to know exactly how this money is spent, how it is being implemented. Uh, and they want more information on the overall strategy before they say they can and proceed. And Nicole, I want to ask you about former interim speaker Patrick McHenry, who, of course, um, was leading the House as, as much as he could when there was a big question mark about who would be the permanent speaker. He has now said that he is not going to seek reelection. Why not? And should we expect other lawmakers to follow him out? of Congress. Uh, yeah, well, many lawmakers have already run for the exits, uh, so much so in record numbers. And now, of course, uh, Patrick McHenry becoming the latest, which is notable because, of course, he was the one who kind of saved the day, right, uh, during that uh, protracted speaker battle earlier this fall, serving as the acting speaker, the speaker pro tem. Uh, but look, and also keep in mind that he was a key ally of former speaker Kevin McCarthy. He is someone who is very interested integral to that debt limit deal that we saw earlier this year. Uh, so it is a loss in terms of uh, the Republican conference, as he was kind of one of the more moderate uh, members, uh, but certainly a sign of what we were seeing uh, writ large here in the Capitol, as many members, both in the House and Senate, have announced that they won't seek re-election next year, in particular, because many of them frustrated uh, with the way this place is working or the lack thereof. And that is something that you cover for us every single day. Nicole, thank you so much for being with us. You bet. 
Next, we hear from Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy, who is a part of a bipartisan group of lawmakers working on a border security negotiation. You're streaming America Decides. We have to affect real policy change at the border, and that is a necessary condition to anything we do going forward. We go home to our town halls, they ask us a very important question. How can we be engaged in securing the border of foreign countries if we can't secure our own? Welcome back to America Decides. The clock is ticking for lawmakers to pass the White House's aid plan for Ukraine and Israel. House Speaker Mike Johnson is among the Republicans demanding that any national security package begins with securing the southern border. Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy joins us now. He is leading the charge for Democrats as part of a bipartisan group of six senators working to put together a border security package. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. Sure, thanks for having me. So on Monday, you were pretty clear. You said that there was no path forward on reaching a deal. So tell me, has anything changed between then and now? Well, first of all, let me say that I think it's absolutely tragic that we're in this conversation. We all agree that we need to save Ukraine from Vladimir Putin's aggression. And I think it's absolutely heartbreaking that Republicans are insisting this domestic political issue be solved as a ransom in order to save Europe from Vladimir Putin. I have a lot of domestic political issues that I care about. I think the gun violence epidemic is out of control in this country. But I'm not insisting that Republicans agree with me on the issue of gun violence in order to save Ukraine. We need to deal with one crisis at a time. But Republicans have said they will abandon Ukraine, they will hand Ukraine to Vladimir Putin if they don't get what they want on immigration. So I'm in the room uh, trying to figure out if there's a space where Democrats and Republicans can agree on immigration policy changes. Unfortunately, thus far, Republicans have not presented anything, anything to Democrats that we would support, that would frankly be in the best traditions of um, uh, America's immigration policy. And uh, if they do uh, actually have a desire to get to a compromise, then you know, my door will continue to be open. But in the meantime, um, the fate of the world hangs in the balance. Ukraine needs this money. They are running out of ammunition as we speak. And this dilly-dallying by Republicans is terrible for global security. I hear what you're saying, but I think a lot of Americans just want to know, are you making any progress at all? Or does it seem like you're not going to get there? I mean, in order to make progress, Republicans have to propose ideas that can pass the House and the Senate. And so far, what I've heard from Republicans is their conservative hardline wish list. Um, that does not have the votes to pass the House and the Senate. Remember, probably half or more of the Republicans in the House of Representatives are going to vote against Ukraine no matter what's in the package. So this needs to be a true bipartisan agreement. And so far, the ideas Republicans have put on the table, like just closing the border to anyone who's trying to enter the country, even if they are legitimately fleeing terror or torture, those are going to be non-starters with Democrats and not starters with the majority of Americans who you know, do think America should remain a compassionate country. They want fewer illegal crossings, but they don't want to shut down the immigration system to people who have valid claims of asylum. Senator Langford spoke about uh, sort of the state of play this morning. I want to play what he said a little bit and, and get your reaction on the other side. I'm confident it can be met, it can be done. It's just a matter of everybody staying at the table to be able to finish everything out. Uh, and we'll see if we actually get there. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm focused on trying to be able to finish out by the end of the year. Do you share that optimism that you'll get there by the end of the year, Senator? Only if Republicans um, start actually negotiating with Democrats. Um, I, 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 you know, there's a difference between saying that you are willing to get to a result and actually putting on the table proposals that can get you to a uh, result. A cynic might look at this and come to the conclusion that Republicans don't actually want to fund Ukraine, that they are making extreme demands that they know Democrats will not support and the majority of Americans will not support um, so that they can shift the blame for why Vladimir Putin ultimately wins the war in Ukraine. I hope that is not wrong, but right now we are not close to an agreement uh, and I don't want to give the impression to the country or to my colleagues that we are. Uh, it was the White House and President Biden that bundled aid in that supplemental request for Ukraine, for Israel, for the border and Indo-Pacific nations. Was that a mistake to lump border funding with Ukraine aid? Well, we very often do supplemental 
uh, spending bills. Um, and we generally try to keep those narrow to the spending because it's hard enough to do an emergency spending bill, never mind make permanent policy changes for the country. So I don't think this was outside of the normal course of business to propose a set of investments the president needs in order to protect the country and handle the border. But we generally don't uh, append on to that uh, spending request big controversial policy fights. And boy, I don't know that you get more controversial than a debate about immigration in this country. That's a hard one to solve in a matter of weeks when Ukraine's security and Israel's security is uh, hanging in the balance. Um, I want to ask you about um, something else that, that uh, made news today, because, um, you know, as you know, Senator Tuberville uh, finally released the hold on several military nominations, not all, because there are still about a dozen four-star generals that he is holding out for. But can you talk about whether um, you agree with the majority leader who, who you know, um, said that he plans to move quickly now? And, and do you agree with Tuberville, who said that this was a draw? Oh, well, I mean, I think Senator Tuberville, you know, views this job as a game. I mean, I, it's not a sporting event to me. Um, what I know is that he has caused enormous damage to the security of this nation already. Uh, yeah, I'm glad he dropped his holds on literally hundreds of brave men and women who are awaiting promotions in the military. But what he did is put America at risk for the last six months, as we didn't have uh, high-ranking uh, officers in key spots. And he has chilled anyone's interest in um, get, going into the military. He's chilled many people's interest in going into the military or remaining in the military. Because now, if you're in the military and hoping to be a general, um, you know that there are going to be senators who are going to play political games with your nomination and your promotion, having nothing to do with your merits. And the fact that he is still holding up the promotions of generals based on his opposition to abortion policy, it's going to cause... Uh, untold damage as more and more high-ranking officers are going to leave the military because they don't want to go through what Senator Tuberville is making all of these uh, candidates for general go through. Senator Chris Murphy will be closely tracking your work on that border package and hope you'll come back. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Prosecutors have outlined the evidence they plan to use against former President Donald Trump in his upcoming obstruction case. We'll discuss the new court filing next. Your streaming America Decides. Welcome back to America Decides. Special Counsel Jack Smith plans to present evidence that shows former President Donald Trump used the support of Capitol rioters as part of an attempt to block the transfer of presidential power. In a new court filing, prosecutors highlight previous election denialism, the promise of January 6th pardons, music collaborations with jailed rioters, and more. CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett joins us now. Major, what did we learn today? So this is a prosecution document. It is, if you will, a roadmap of what those prosecutors in March of next year, when this trial is supposed to begin, will allege against the former president. We don't know if it's all going to show up in trial, but it is a roadmap. And it's important that it begins not in 2016, not in 2015, it goes back to 2012. When prosecutors go back and find quotes from then political gadfly Donald Trump saying that votes were switched in the 20, 20, 2012 election from Romney to Obama. False then, allegations of vote flipping false in 2020. They also go back to the debate which I covered in 2016 in which then Republican nominee Donald Trump said he wasn't sure he would concede the election if Hillary Clinton was declared the winner. These things will be part of what the prosecution will allege is a systemic pattern of wanting to A, sow doubts about elections, B, act conspiratorially, use instruments of power or persuasion to block an election result you disagree with, all of which prosecutors allege culminated in the events leading up to and on January 6, 2021. So they're building their case that January 6th was simply the bubbling over, but this is something that built up for years. They might say the inevitable result of all of this rhetoric and actions. And importantly, from a legal perspective, what the former president's attorneys suggest is or assert, is he's asking questions. He's trying to get to the bottom of things that many voters are concerned about. The prosecutors will allege no. You were not asking questions. You were not trying to ferret out the truth. 
You came to a conclusion not based in evidence, and then you tried to use that fraudulent conclusion to deny the rightful occupant of the White House a transition of power and everything that comes with it. And of course, the former president has continued to maintain his innocence. Mm -hmm. He will not say that tomorrow on the debate stage nope. because he won't be there. He will not. Um, there will be four other Republican hopefuls. But I wonder, Major, you know, they're all trying to get to second place right now. He's not going to be there. Do these debates even matter? It's hard to see how they do in the grand scheme of things. A distant second is still a distant second, and that's all what the, the competition is about right now. It is worth noting that the field is shrinking faster than it has before, certainly faster than it did in 2016. That might give the anti-Trump Republican coalition some prospect of success, but it's still hard to see. Everyone is going to be looking tomorrow night for, is there a moment in which Nikki Haley decisively distances herself in a positive upward direction from Ron DeSantis? Ron DeSantis will be fighting for his political life Tomorrow night's debate encounter is really between those two and nobody else. And DeSantis has recently called her a puppet um, <laughs> after Super PAC reportedly, after her Super PAC reportedly received a quarter of a million dollars, not from Republicans, mm -hmm. but from a top Democratic donor. What does that say about Haley? And maybe even more importantly, what does that say about President Biden's campaign? Two questions. Let me try to get to them. One, typically politicians care a lot more about who funds the other politicians' campaign than voters do, because mm -hmm. they want that money that they're not getting. Sure. This case, it might be interesting to Republicans, but why is a Democrat supporting Nikki Haley? So that might have some traction or salience. If I'm President Biden, I'm certainly on the phone. Like, uh, hello. <laughs> you, I know that Trump leads me in some battleground states, but Nikki Haley leads me by even more. And Democrats say out loud, Nikki Haley would be tougher to beat than Donald Trump. We don't really have a method to go after her, at least not yet. We have one to go after former President Trump if he's the nominee. So this will come up tomorrow. The whole puppet idea, are you an establishment figure? Are you a rhino, Republican in name only? Nikki Haley will have to deal with it. And I want to ask you about your podcast, The mm -hmm. Takeout, which yep. we all love here, um, because you, you spoke with former Representative Adam Kinzinger yep. about a potential Liz Cheney run, which, yes. of course, um, you know, has been in the headlines as she promotes a new book and, and kind of flirts with this idea. So tell us what he said. So Adam Kinzinger describes himself as a homeless Republican, a Republican who won't give up that party identification but feels he is displaced. He can't recognize his party. Worked with Liz Cheney very closely on the House Select Committee on January 6th, and now Liz Cheney has a book, and she says, I might run as a third-party nominee. Is Adam Kinzinger supportive of that? Yes or no? Let's find out. So for her, I mean, if if a run as an independent for Liz Cheney damages Donald Trump, then I think it's smart. Go for it. Right. It's a, it's a good I would love to be in any other environment where a, a true conservative party could make a run. The only concern I have, and this is with any third party attempt, is, you know, are you going to just take away from Joe Biden? Are you gonna get and that's it. That's where everyone is who's in this camp of we don't want Trump reelected. Do you hurt Joe Biden's prospects. And Adam Kinzinger also told me he is definitely, if Biden's the nominee, voting for Joe Biden over Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much, Major. We will tune into the entire podcast, and you can do that as well. You can listen to the full interview with the former congressman, Adam Kinzinger, on The Takeout. It airs this Sunday at 5 p.m. Eastern on the CBS News app and wherever you like to get your podcasts. And another programming note, we will have special coverage of the fourth GOP presidential debate in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, this Wednesday, that's tomorrow, you can stream an hour-long edition of America Decides at 5 p.m. Eastern and at 10 p.m. for analysis after the debate. That does it for today. You can stream America Decides Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News.